Hello, everyone. This is April Cox. We have a special speaker today with us, Dave Chesson, who is one of my favorite self-publishing gurus, someone that I look up to very much and have modeled a lot of what I do. Welcome, Dave Chesson, back again to the author work group. We have a list of a number of questions and things from the author team. So why don't you start by introducing yourself a little bit, and if it's okay with you, we'll jump right into some of the questions from the group. Well, I'm Dave. I will tell you that I didn't always think that I would be an author. I actually have dyslexia, so I grew up with the belief that writing was not in my future. I went into becoming a physics major, you know, joined the military, was on submarines, went as far away from, from writing as possible. But it doesn't mean that your desire to write ever goes away. And so it wasn't until I was stationed in Korea without my family that we really talked about what it was that I wanted to do with my life and what was my goals. And it wasn't to be an admiral. It wasn't to continue in the military or anything like that. It was about finding a way to be home with my children. I didn't want to jump from one nine to five job, traveling job that is, to another nine to five traveling job. So we really started looking at how will we be able to build an income that will allow us to exit out of a certain job and into being, you know, and doing something like that. And for me, being on the other side of the world, it was writing. It wasn't that all of a sudden I became this incredible writer. It wasn't that my, you know, I overcame dyslexia, which is still always there. It was that I started to understand more about market. I understand why Amazon did what it did. Why would it show one person's book over another? Why is it that this one's selling more even though this other book is actually better? And when I started to use kind of my analytical side to try to understand these things, it's what helped me to not only create a better book, but also be able to position it better so that it had uh, more ability to get in front of the right shoppers. And so that was really the culmination of what got me into this. And I'll tell you, it was uh, two to three years of really working on my writing craft. I was able to not only make more money from just books uh, than I was full-time for the military, but it's allowed me to be home. And I'm here in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, my kids, I just got to take them to go do their presentations. Uh, one of the only dads in the crowd, because it's a work day for most. And I've been doing that for four years and I absolutely love it. So I'm very grateful for the opportunities that Amazon gave someone like me on the other side of the world to be able to create an author platform and be able to live that dream. And my children are definitely enjoying it. <laughs> yeah. So. And what I think I love most about you, Dave, is that you have the heart of a teacher. So, you know, well, what you. prompted you to really start working towards helping other authors start learning and helping them to do what you had figured out through all of your efforts? When the time happened that I was trying to figure it out, I don't think anybody's really talking about Amazon in that way. I don't think anybody has really taken a deep dive into why Amazon does what it does. Now, I had had the fortunate experience of spending years studying Google, which is a different search engine. But people go to Google, they type something into it, and Google tries to figure out what to show them. Why does it show one website over another? Like, that was something I was very ingrained into. So when the time came that I looked at Amazon, I kind of applied that whole background as well as, you know, my science analytical mind into Amazon to try to understand it, you know, and it's what it calls the A9 algorithm. Their search engine right at the top has its own name and actually has its own building, its own company, its own 3000 employees. And so really getting into the nitty gritty and trying to understand that, I kind of felt like it was one of the first at the time. And so I felt since nobody was really talking about it, that this was an opportunity to kind of share the experiences as well as the knowledge that I had. And that's how Kindlepreneur was created. That's amazing. And it's a great segue into my first question, which is since you do kind of have more insight into Amazon and what's going on there, can you give us any kind of sneak peeks into some things that are coming or changes there? And it, do you have any insight into, you know, advantage? Will we ever get advantage back open? Hmm. Um, anything you can share with us? Well, uh, overall, Amazon is an ever-changing beast. And, and the truth is they're trying to improve the revenue. That's what they want. They want to make more money. So we're seeing a lot of things where they take something away, but some people still see it. And what we call that is A-B testing. They're going to test a certain IP address or a certain type of market, and they're going to take something away. Like all of a sudden, also bots will disappear, right? And the also bots are on your sales page and it's right under, you know, your description and it's 
other books that people also bought as well as this book, right? Mm -hmm. Those are really great. All of a sudden, authors started losing their minds because it just disappeared for some. And then others were like, what are you talking about? I see it right there. It's right there. Amazon's doing this like crazy. You'll see something. Your friend next door won't. Two weeks later, you won't see it. And that friend will. And what they're trying to do is they're saying, hey, when we take this thing away, does it make us more money or does it make us less money? And they're like, okay, it makes us less money. Let's put it back. And they're testing things. So one thing I'm going to say to everybody is, is that they're doing this at a extremely higher rate than they did last year. So as you're on forums or if you're on Facebook and you see people saying, oh my goodness, something's gone away and you quickly see somebody says, wait, no, I see it. That's exactly what's happening. And I think this is even more so with their advertisement system. Amazon's advertisement system is pretty new. I mean, respectively, it's technically been around for about four years, but authors weren't really using it or that it wasn't really at the forefront of marketing efforts until about two years ago. And Amazon's CEO, Jeff Bezos, flat out said that advertisement is a future for them. Jeff doesn't make a lot of statements and really he doesn't talk a lot about amazon.com. He actually talks about their server systems and AWS. So the fact that he would point back to the marketplace to amazon.com and specifically talk about their new ad system, that I think speaks volumes about where Amazon's mind is, where they're going and what they think is most important. So they're A-B testing their ad system like crazy, which means they're putting a lot of resources and effort and brilliant minds into it. Their CEO has specifically said that this is their future. I think that Amazon ads is going to be a larger part of Amazon's future as we go by. And I think we're going to see a lot of changes. I think that they're going to roll out a lot. Authors have felt sort of always left behind because what was it like four or five years ago, the KDP dashboard was horrendous. Reporting was atrocious. And then four years later, they finally fix it to show something. We usually get the tail end of love, but I think that the ads platform can apply to all both products, physical products and books. So first things first, Amazon ads, I think are going to be a huge thing and they're going to change dramatically as Amazon learns to make more money from it. Another thing that I'm seeing a lot too is Amazon's really focusing on categories more so than they ever have. I think that Amazon's starting to look at categories as a filter to help people find the right kind of books. And they're starting to get this more. And what I mean by this is that if you go to a category page on Amazon, on the left side for some of them, you will start to see these filter boxes, little check boxes that you can click. And the information they're putting on the left there is extremely beneficial. It's really cool to see what Amazon thinks are good filters for that category. So say for example, it's romance, right? Well immediately for such a broad category like romance on the left, they're going to break down all of the biggest types of romances out there so that you can help to figure out, okay, yeah, that's not my kind of romance. What I'm looking for is something as niche as second chance romance. Boom, click that. And now you come to a new page that has second chance romances, but now they'll start to list more niche terms like time periods, settings, character types, and they're getting this. And I think that they're starting to realize the importance of categories in helping avid shoppers find what they're looking for. But I'll caveat that statement by also adding that I think that this is more important for fiction writers than nonfiction writers. I don't think Amazon's really cared too much about the fiction category, or excuse me, the nonfiction categories. And they're not exactly doing that sidebar thing but they are focusing on fiction. As the owner or the founder of Publisher Rocket, we actually index all 11,000 Amazon book and ebook categories, and we're crawling to pull information to get sales trends and understand what's going on. And we see that Amazon is changing, updating, and adding fiction categories like crazy. Uh, we're averaging 1.5 new categories added to Amazon every day. The most common question when I ask some of our author team, what are you looking for to get some advice from Dave Chesson. By far, the biggest thing that I heard is we all want to spend less on ads and we want them to be more effective. Do you have any advice for our group of children's book authors on things that we should be considering as we're pulling our ads together? Yeah, that's a really good question. The thing about ads is... I think a lot of what works with ads is whether or not the entire package works. And what I mean by this is that 
the process of how in, how enticing is your cover, uh, which will induce how many clicks you get. But then importantly, how good your book description is a major factor as into how many of those clicks convert to sales. One thing that I really love about Amazon ads is we finally get to see the numbers to kind of figure out where the hang up is. A while ago, I was working on a science fiction book and the cover was amazing. I mean, it was just absolutely captivating. It was, it was brilliant. The problem was, was that when you got to the book description, it had two issues. The first thing was, was that it didn't fit the feel of what the cover was. The cover to me looked like a post-apocalyptic dystopian ravaged world, you know, with what looked like a, well, I'm going to guess is a father and a daughter, right? Storming, you know, kind of walking through and wading through it. But when you got to the book description itself, it wasn't until the very last sentence that I finally figured out that, okay, yeah, that is what it is. Like it just didn't fit. Now imagine you're a shopper and you see that cover and you think, oh, this is what I'm going to look. And you start reading the first line or two of the book description. And it's like, wait a second, what? That's not what I thought. I'm just clicking back. And that's what this person was discovering. And just by improving that connection, right? Cause let's put ourselves in the, the place of the shopper. I see this cover. I imagine what it is. I need to deliver on that in the book description so people understand what they're seeing. And when you do that, you're going to see higher conversions, which means your A cause goes down. And when your A cause goes down, Amazon also is starting to take notice of the fact of, hey, when we show this book more often, it makes more money, right? And makes more money, mean you know, it's more clicks, happier customer, that makes both more money. Let's show this more often. Whereas this book, we've been showing it like crazy. We've been giving it Amazon space. It's not doing anything. They're going to start to be like, no, we're not going to show this. You know, we're going to show this other one, even though they're paying less, but at least they're making us money. So I think that's a big factor. Now, when it comes to children's book, I think there's a couple of things that, that pull into this. I think first off is when I look at a children's book cover, okay, especially as a parent, which is the person who's purchasing, I need to know that it fits the age or the demographic of my children, okay? What I've seen be a disjoint between the two is I look at a cover that looks, you know, it, it's uh, not as defined. It's maybe, it looks like it's for a two-year-old, right? And then I start reading the book description and it's written like a literary work. You know, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's for the two-year-old and maybe it's not. Sometimes people have just gotten some very cheap covers put together that end up lowering the age demographic when really it's some for someone older. When I'm a, when I'm a parent, that's what I want to know. I want to know that I'm getting the right age level for my, my children. I definitely recommend somewhere in your book description, maybe near the bottom where you start to do a call to action, call to action saying, all right, great, buy this book. Uh, but right above that is reaffirm their mind that this is the right age group. But go through and look how you wrote your book description and ask yourself if it is written when you're trying to describe your story. Does it feel like you're talking about young A or YA, excuse me, young adult? Or is it in the right you know, tone, temperament, beat of the demographic that you're doing? I think that's one of the biggest disconnects that's caused a lot of uh, children books advertisements to kind of fall flat. Just as a follow-up to that, if you get stuck in that situation where you've had maybe a poor description and you've gone back and fixed that, but Amazon has in their minds, you know, this is not a good book, we're not going to show it. Is there any way to come back from that so that you can start getting recognized again and start getting served up and getting the impressions that you need? Yeah, the good news is, is that Amazon doesn't like physically mark a book in, in their database and say this one's bad. What they do is look is like the campaign is bad. So I would say one thing for sure is to just start a new campaign for your Amazon ads. They give it a new fresh start. Maybe it's a different focus, but I wouldn't keep working on the campaign that isn't making the money. I wouldn't add to it if it's really dropped and you made some changes. So start a new campaign. Okay. Now, with Amazon ads, we can have up to a thousand keywords. Usually there's a, a handful of them that perform well. Should we be, you know, using a thousand keywords as a way of testing? Is there a magic number or any advice as we're creating new campaigns with regard to the number of keywords or how to whittle down those keywords as we move forward? Yeah, well, when I start to see a keyword that seems to be doing better than others, uh, there's actually a process that I like to do to help kind of increase it. The first thing is I try to look at that keyword and ask myself why. 
why is that one somehow generating so much interest and causing people to click? This is a really important question to ask yourself because once you understand the why, it can help you to make other decisions, all right? Uh, first thing is when you know the why, I like to then create a separate campaign that's centered around that why. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, first off was, again, it was a science fiction book that I was working with, and uh, it was a hard science book. And we noticed that quantum mechanics seemed to drive a lot of sales. We're like, why? Why is quantum mechanics, right? That's nonfiction. I mean, granted, science fiction likes to use it in there, you know, but, but why is that? And then we realized, well, you know, there are a lot of sci-fi fans who are physics nerds like myself who are having to look up or they're looking up nonfiction information. And when they see, you know, and when they see a good hard science book at the top, and because it's an advertisement, it connects with them and they'll make that click and therefore they'll make the sales. So what we did was we created an entire campaign centered around every quantum physics terms from quarks to neutrinos to, you know, string theory to famous names, you know, of, of scientists, all of that. And that campaign absolutely crushed it. We had a person who wrote a book about dealing with a loss of a pet. And when that person was doing the campaigns, we found out that one of the keywords that really crushed it was called, I think it was called a dog's life, which was some very popular movie. And it was about a dog who kept reincarnating or something and but following the same owner so we decided to say let's target popular movies and uh famous dog books uh just you know the old yeller the you know anything and that campaign just absolutely crushed it for her because it was connecting that book to media and other books and movies that were dealing with dog death. So it was a very strong connection that we just hadn't thought about. When it comes to children's book, most authors really focus on just trying to latch on to an existing children's book that people may look for. That's true, but you're, you're competing with a whole bunch of authors. Uh, for some of your books, you may really be able to benefit from that. But what I would ask children's books authors to think about is, you know, what tertiary term can you really think of or you know, apply yourself. So say, for example, you've written a children's book about dealing with bullying, right? Think about maybe some of the movies or some of the other books, because most of the time it's parents buying. So what would the parent be looking at and then see a book about, you know, bullying for their children and be like, oh man, you know, that's not a bad idea. Like, let me look into it. I wasn't thinking to look for that, but that looks like a good book for my son or daughter. These are ways that you can then kind of outthink a lot of the market and get in front still of the right market, but get away from all the other authors that you're competing with for clicks and bids. So with regard to volume, do you ever do like a thousand keywords and just see what sticks? Well, generally speaking, I do at least two to 200 to 300 keywords per campaign to start off with. Anything less than that, and you're gonna have a hard time getting any traction whatsoever in the campaign. However, though, I really like to give myself enough room because when I do see a keyword, that works, okay, or a bunch of keywords. It's kind of like casting out a wide net first and then finding out what fish you caught, right? And then when you look at that, there are a couple things that you can do. You can either change the bid so that you're showing up more often. You could also go in and change your desired position, okay? So instead of it showing at the middle of the search, you know, the search results, you could put it at the top. Um, you can change the bid to move it to the pot top. You could also tell Amazon Suite, this is working for me. So Amazon, go ahead and change that bid up or down as you need to so that you can show it. There's all these things that you can do with those keywords. But also, if you start to see that there's a grouping of keywords, you can add more keywords to it that are centered on that term. And you can kind of build the momentum of the campaign itself. Generally speaking, most of my campaigns end up at around 800 per. So Pat asks, for a new self-published author, how much would you recommend to spend on a first-time ad with Amazon? The bid prices are, are astronomically high of what they're re recommending to start with. Yeah, don't, don't listen to their recommendation. I, okay. I've, that has never been... Matter of fact, when they say that you should raise the bid or whatever, 25% of the time they're right. Uh, is from my experience, 75% uh, of the time, it doesn't matter. That's something I think that they really need to work on is their bid recommendations. So I, I don't put a lot of stock into that. 
I generally start at 25 cents, even more so it's actually 24, 23. Why 24, 23? Because, or excuse me, it's 26 because most people go 25. So I do one cent more. We always think of a number and we, that number that we think of is probably the same number that generally everybody else does. So I'll choose some weird number. So that's one recommendation. If you're thinking 25, then go 26 or 27. If you're thinking 50 cents, then do 49. It's just that one little thing I've seen has done an uptick and it's a good strategy. But with that said though, I think there's two parts to it. First off is, like I said before, through your ads, you can find where the disconnect is. You know, if nobody's clicking on your ads, and your keywords are decent, right? It should be showing up for parents that are shopping. Then that's a really clear indication that the cover is not enticing anybody to want to click. You know, the cover and title is just not there. If you're seeing lots of people click, but nobody buy, now you know at least the book description isn't there. I would say that when you're first starting off, given enough time, I would say maybe $5 a day is probably the min. If this is your first time, $5 a day, give it one to two weeks, And the good part is, is that I think even just the data you'll collect to be able to know where the disconnect is, is worth that amount, right? Just right there. But push comes to shove, you start, if you give it one to two weeks, you'll at least start to see other things happen. Like for example, if you're under KU, uh, the KU page is red. That's the thing that gets you paid, right? Well, you could have had a lot of people from your advertisement download your book, you know, cool, but you don't get to see that from your ad. And then all of a sudden, a week or two later, those reads, those pages read start to come in. And now you're starting to see the efforts of your ad. So that's why I tell people you want to give it at least one to two weeks before you make a decision on whether it's working or not. I think statistically speaking, that's about a right time period for you to have enough data collected to know if this is good or not. But in the end, one to two weeks later, you can look back and you ask yourself, okay, great. Customers aren't seeming to want to click on this. And by the way, you may say, well, that's just for ads. But what I found is that when you fix wherever that problem is, whether it's the cover or the book description, or you get it right, all of your other marketing efforts benefit from it. Just think about it. If only 1% of the people who clicked on your book is actually buying it, generally speaking, it's about 1% are also clicking and buying it from your email blast, from your, the promotion blast, from the other things. It's generally around the same area. But once you fix it, generally speaking, all the conversion rates go up. So great. A reasonable monthly budget for Amazon ads. Katie would like to know what should one allocate per title typically? Well, that's a hard question to answer because if things are working, a cause is great. (laughs) You should be budgeting more. If it's not, then you need to kind of budget back until you figure out why. So I would say that's a dynamic number. Starting with $5 a day, most likely you're not going to hit your $5 mark per day. I think that's a pretty safe number for people. The purpose of Amazon ads is to get your book in front of shoppers, right? I mean, that's the beauty of it. Back in the day before ads, we would do a lot of stuff and just hope we could get in front of it. At least you could take that one component out. But Amazon ads doesn't assure you that you make sales. The combination from the, again, the cover, title, description, that makes a sale. That funnel, if you will. Uh, makes the sale. So if you start the ads and you're seeing that there's a hang up and you can't fix it, I would not be putting more money into the ads because you're only driving more people to something that's not exactly working yet. But when you start to see that it is absolutely working or that you're seeing that there's an area that is working, then absolutely uh, add more to it. Because if you put in $1 and you get $2, why not put $2 in? And so you get $4 and just make sure that you continue to see that rate. Now, I know you said, don't touch it, like leave it alone. I've heard some people say, if you're in there tweaking ads, even just a tweak here or there, it does something and it, I don't know, maybe it starts over. Is there anything, any truth to that? Oh, tweaking is fine. What I meant by leave it alone is what people will do is they'll start an ad and then two days into it, they're like, oh, my A cost isn't there. And they just shut it down. They're like, not going to do that. The problem is, is that there's just not enough statistical data. Plus Amazon's a bit late on reporting stuff. So give it some time before you make the overall call on the campaign or just ads in in general, but tweaking, maybe adding some keywords, uh, changing some bid prices, changing some of the stuff on the inside, that stuff. Absolutely. But at least give it a good week or two before you make an overall call on whether A, your book process, your conversion rates are good, or B, that campaigns are working for you. Okay, so there's no harm in going in and tweaking 
adding keywords here or there. That doesn't do anything like starting things over with Amazon or nope. messing up what's going on. That's great to know. So the other thing is with regard to your ads in general, when you're starting as a new author, would you normally recommend, you know, add an automatic ad, add a category ad, add a manual ad, and kind of see what happens when you're first launching? Yeah, I can say out of experience, certain ad types have a higher chance of success than others. It's kind of hard to make a blanket, blanket, excuse me, blanket a statement because there are people who just found success in one particular ad, even though most people don't. I'm not a fan of category ads. I'm not a fan of lock screen ads. I will say, generally speaking, those have been a money pit for a lot of authors. The reason for this is that when you select a category, okay, first off, there's 11,000 categories on Amazon, but there's a much smaller number that they actually offer you for advertisement. Because it's easier to select a category and sit back, there's a lot more competition, which means the cost per click is going to be higher. Furthermore, let's imagine that you wrote this particular book in this niche, but you choose a general, you know, category like children's book. Now you're paying high cost per click with a whole bunch of publishing companies because publishing companies tend to do the categories and the lock screens a lot more than they should, but you're, you're competing with all these. And you're really going for something super general. I mean, imagine like you go to type in fantasy into to Amazon. What's the chances Amazon's going to be, be able to present the perfect kind of fantasy that you like? You know, same thing with this advertisement. With regards to lock screen, I'm not a fan of it either because there's two things to it. Number one, same thing that I talked about on the last one, which is very competitive, high cost per click. And I have not seen Amazon get the algorithm right to choose the right things to show. I think when they finally figure it out, and they start saying, hey, this person has bought, you know, children's books two to five before. Let's show children's books that are ranging two to five that are for boys. You know, like when they start doing that automatically, I think lock screens will be awesome, but they're not doing it yet. And so therefore I don't see a lot of conversion, but I don't know why they haven't figured this out, but they should. When that does, then jump on it. But right now, I'm not seeing that. The second thing that's also bad about lock screen is that when I go to pick up a Kindle and I'm ready to read, I'm not in the mind to buy. I've already got a book. Most people are not buying their next book on a Kindle. They're buying it from amazon.com. They're buying it when they're shopping for, you know, for detergent. They, they end up going on a track to go find their next book. So you're fighting to get your book in front of somebody who's not ready to shop, right? They're not buying. They're mainly there to read. Whereas the other advertisements are in front of shoppers, right? That's one of the big reasons why I'm not a fan of lock screen yet. Okay. So in general, automatic ads, I've seen some perform really well. Others, you know, manual does better. There's no rhyme or reason for me when I'm trying to set things up. Sometimes I get lucky with automatic. Other times they just do nothing. Yeah. So this kind of all ties back to the first thing I said at the beginning of this, right? Is Amazon's testing and they're changing and they're, they're really putting a lot of time and effort into their advertisement system, right? Automatic about two years ago was the most horrendous thing possible. Amazon just sucked at on automatic. They could not get any good information from it. They would test it. It would be high clicks or, you know, just be high costs. Not a lot of good came from it. However, though, Amazon's gotten a lot better, especially over the past six to eight months. They've really changed that one. I think they finally tweaked that algorithm, right, to do better than, you know, what I was kind of hypothesizing for lock screen is that they started to realize that there are tertiary keywords and all these other keywords that kind of branch off of something. And they're going to automatically test and kind of figure some things out for you. I think they're getting better. Here's the thing though. Again, I'm trying to generalize. Uh, I, I usually hate to give a general statement because there's always special cases, but generally speaking, you need to give automatic two, three to four weeks before Amazon can finally start to show something from it, okay? it takes them time to figure out. So what do we mean by automatic? Well, automatic is where you basically tell Amazon, hey, you know, figure it out. Here's a couple of, of things. And then they're going to automatically test and pull and find and, and work to add, change, delete keywords for you in a way. The problem is for them to collect enough data and then start doing some things right, it takes them a while. Uh, but it is way better than it was a year or two ago. So if you tried automatic a year or two ago and it did not do well for you, may want to give it a try, but give it enough time for Amazon to figure it out. 
that being said, manual is uh, still pretty excellent because through processes, you can get a whole bunch of keywords that gives Amazon a whole smorgasbord to test. And then you're getting the data and can make the right decisions from those. That's great. Pat is wondering, is there a good day of the week to start a sponsored ad? Does day of the week matter? No, I wouldn't say for advertising, even with long-term advertisements that I've set, like there's one ad campaign been going for about four years and it's just been excellent on its own. And I cannot see any patterns or anything waves of where, man, I do much better on Mondays, you know, or anything like that. It's funny as my Google analytics shows these waves, you know, people go to Kindlepreneur and read things on a certain date and I can then plan email blasts because of that. But Amazon, I haven't seen anything. Okay. What about as you're setting up keywords, broad, phrase, or exact? How should an author use those? And do you find some work better than others? I like broad, especially when I'm starting a campaign. The reason for that is you just never know what's going to end up working. And so with broad phrase, I give Amazon as many opportunities to show it. And again, I'm not paying Amazon until somebody clicks it. So the more opportunities I can give Amazon to find a way or to find an opportunity that, oh, you know, nobody's going for this. So let's show his book for that. I think it's really important to gain that data. And then once you start to see which keywords are working, as you create either new keywords or you're creating new campaigns, you can start to pare that down and say, nope, this exact keyword is the only thing I want to show up for. Especially in the romance area, there are certain terms that, you know, like a wholesome Christian book would not want to show up for, they can start to create negative keywords and just say, not a chance. I don't want to show up for this. Or, you know, I don't want to be associated with that. Or this particular phrase has gotten a lot of clicks and no sales. And I know why I just don't want it. So you can start to improve. So to recap on that, I recommend start on broad, see what's working. And then as you start to understand what's working, start to pare down and do exact match, uh, you know, more negative keywords and things like that. That's great advice on tweaking and using negative keywords. How often do you typically go in and analyze and update your ad state? I honestly will give myself uh, one day a week. Now, when I first launch, I'm probably in there every other day or so tweaking. However, though, I make it a point like every Tuesday morning, I reward myself by going through the numbers. And if you mark it on your calendar, you're going to see a lot more success than if you just the next time I think of it, you know, it could either be this rabbit hole that, that sucks so much of your time because you're doing it every day. But if you're very particular about the time and you're doing it consistently, you're going to gain more experience, gain more intuition. You're going to see a lot more coming from it because it's a part of your routine. But at the same time, I feel like that's sufficient to at least keep something that's bringing and generating some money. Keep it going. Keep that machine greased and oiled and moving. In general, what do you target for ACOS to get to? Is 50% or less? Or I've seen some say 75% is fine, but it's, it's, the recommendations are kind of all over the place. Yeah, well, the true thing is, is that the recommendation should be, it depends. It really depends on the overall thing that you're working for. Uh, for example, when I worked with Pat Flynn, he had a companion course and he was getting a lot of email subscribers from people who bought his book. Uh, therefore, his A cost, he didn't care if it was 400% because there was so much more money that was being made from it. I would also say, for example, the KU authors, so like romance authors, I would tell them flat out, you know, your A cost should be a lot higher if you're under KU because your pages read is not being counted in the development of your A cost. And there are a lot of KU romance readers. You're probably making more money from KU pages read than you are from the sales. So make sure that you're accounting for your pages read when you're looking at your ACOS number. Another thing is, is that what is the motivation behind getting the book? If it's just straight up making the money, right? If I paid 10 bucks, I better get, you know, $20. Like that's what I want. Then you should start to generate an ACOS that is truly worth it. So to kind of recap on that, if there are other ways of monetizing or other reasons behind making sure to get out that book, that should be a major factor into your personal development of the target ACoS. Whereas if it is just, I need to make sure that A, the time is worth it to do all these ads and B, the money is at least coming in, then the ACoS has to be, you know, depending on your pricing, but it should be, you know, 70% or less. And again, depending on the importance of your sales, of your time and everything so another thing that kind of goes with a cause as well is that there are certain 
subjects that are so niche. Say, for example, you wrote a book on pressure cookers in RVs. I don't know, something so insanely small. Like maybe there are, say, 50 people total on Amazon a month that that could fit, you know? Or maybe a grand total of a thousand people ever to show up on Amazon might fit, all right? No matter how much you pump money into the ads, you're probably not going to be making hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? It's just, there's a certain point where the market size is so small that your potential for great amount of money is going to be extremely small. But your A cause could be insane, insanely good, that is. When I've done niche books, I've hit A causes of 10 to 5%. Because all I'm trying to do is, you know, there's only five books out there on this particular subject. I just want to be number one. And if I'm number one, I basically take more of those sales. So that person who writes a very niche book is maybe making $100 or $200 a month, but their aid cost is like 5%. So all of that's just to explain why I think the real answer for this really depends. And I hope some of these examples kind of, kind of help the listeners here to maybe develop their own personal a cost instead of looking for the magical number that people say you should do. I think it really comes down to what's happening inside of your particular situation. Right. And I think with children's book authors, our typical size of a length of a book is only 32 pages. So Unlike, you know, romance authors or not people that write novels, we don't get a lot from page reads or, you know, it, it's a lot harder to, to move that forward. And I think like the example of that kind of explains why you'll hear so many different answers. Romance authors would swear by this, you know, but like right. niche books would, would swear by this. And that's why there's all these things floating around. Right. The other thing I want to also talk about, I love KDP Rocket or Publisher Rocket now. I typically do a lot of work in that when I'm setting up a new book and we can use it to find good keyword phrases for the metadata and the organic, you know, looking for setting up some good organic terms. Do you have any advice for when we're setting up our listing to make sure that we get indexed. Like what does Amazon do to index our book? How can we make it easier to get those organic searches? And specifically, I, I use your tool to help with that. Mm -hmm. But is there any insight or advice that you have for us to help us get indexed more quickly or, you know, improve our indexing? Right. So there's three parts to, to keywords in that part. There's identifying the target keywords, getting indexed, and then improving rankings. Uh, indexing just means that Amazon acknowledges that you should show up somewhere for that phrase. Could be number one, it could be 1.2 million. The key is they've attached your book to the phrase. So I think the biggest important question is, is how do we improve our rankings? Indexing though will happen so long as that word or phrase is in one of your seven Kindle keyword boxes. Uh, when you go to publish, you'll see those seven Kindle keyword box and you can put something in there. We did an experiment ranging over a thousand books. And then we also crawled, we created a special software to crawl. And we verified that when somebody put a word in there, so long as Amazon acknowledged that the word or phrase should be searchable, the book showed up for it. We also found out too, though, that if you put in some word that you really shouldn't belong to, Amazon wouldn't index you for it. So they're very smart about that. The second thing too, is that Inside of that box, that those seven Kindle keyword boxes, okay, I'll just call it the boxes from now, Amazon will take any combination of the words that you put inside of it and use that in indexing too. So say, for example, inside the box, you wrote magic schoolhouse for children. All right. Amazon will take schoolhouse for children, children, magic schoolhouse, school magic house, all of those different combinations of those phrases, and they will index you for those. So again, so long as it's a phrase that if you type something into Amazon, it would actually show results. There are sometimes they're like, nah, <laughs> we're not showing results for that because that's not a word. That's not a phrase, you know, or whatever. So that's one very important thing to know is, is that all the combinations of those words, pluralizations, they're all taken into account inside the boxes. So that can be important for you because first off, each box allows you 50 characters and 50 characters are... Uh, letters or spaces. So there's, you can put in 50 letters slash spaces inside of one box. My recommendation for indexing though, is that the first four boxes, I do a specific phrase that I absolutely love. 
Okay, uh, if you're using Publisher Rocket, you'll be able to know which words people type in Amazon, how many people per month type that in Amazon, and the competition. And using that information, I find my four perfect phrases, my, my favorites. The reason for this is that when you have a specific phrase, so when you don't try to throw all the words inside the box, your rankings will actually initially be better for those phrases, okay? It's one of those things where it's like word density, you know, how specific are you? And Amazon kind of takes that in account. They actually say that publicly that they take that into account. Uh, we found that in our experiment, that was absolutely true. The other three boxes though, I absolutely love to fill them with all the other specific words that kind of fit. So say we said magic schoolhouse for kids. Okay, so we'll, we'll pretend that this book is about a, a school that's magical and when the kids enter into it, they have a lot of fun and they're learning and their teacher is, is a weird alien, you know, from outer space teaching them, cool. So I found my four phrases, whatever they be. Now let's take some of those other words, weird alien, alien teacher, you know, sing along, like all of those things. Sing along is not perfect for this book, but they are singing. It's not a center stage thing for this book, but it is a tertiary thing. So what I like to do is I take all those terms that really do kind of describe that didn't have a purpose, you know, in my four and I put them all in there. And the reason why I do this is because Amazon will start to take you know, like sing along, say magic schoolhouse, sing along. It will put those next to each other and you'll index for it. And again, it will test and Amazon will see what's happening. The other thing too is, is that I'm giving Amazon a better understanding of what the book is about, all the components to the book itself. So I'm giving them more to work with. We found that the combination of doing the four that are specific to the phrase you like, and then three that include all the tertiary descriptive terms, you know, that kind of describe it. We found that that had the best bang for your buck. You rank better for the real specific ones, but you also showed up and indexed more for more things. And what we find is that if somebody types in a phrase into Amazon and they scroll past certain books and they click and they purchase your book, Amazon will be like, oh, cool. That was a high conversion. And they'll start to show the book more for that keyword term. And if you're doing this enough where you're actually showing that you convert well, Amazon will start to put you in more and more and more keywords and in better rankings. And so they're starting to take that information and choose from there. One takeaway action that anybody here can take, and I feel free to say this because if you're here with April, you're probably a legit author and you care about things. And when I say the, the tactic, you'll understand what I mean. But when you go to launch your book, one of the things I recommend you tell is that if you know somebody wants to buy your book, somebody who is going to buy your book, okay, instead of sending them a link, tell them to, you know, only if you know they'll do these extra steps, but tell them to go to Amazon, type in a certain phrase, find your book and click it and buy it. When they do that, they're sending a direct signal to Amazon that, hey, this book belongs in a better ranking and they'll start moving it up. And the more people it does, you'll move up. The, the reason why this isn't hacking Amazon or doing harm to Amazon is that this gives you the chance to show up at the top for that keyword phrase. But if you are at the top, and people continue, like normal people that aren't connected to you, continue to type it in and skip your book and go to a different book, you will start to fall down to the rankings where you belong. This is just a great tactic to give you that opportunity to prove yourself worthy of the keyword phrase or not. I don't make that public because can you imagine some of the really bad or you know shameful writers out there who would like use something like that? So yes, this is an absolute thing that somebody can do. Okay. Now Priya is saying that she's seen books not coming up in searches, even with their names or the title of the book or author names. So she's not sure what the keyword doesn't seem like there's any point to it. Have you seen that? Do you know what the issue would be there? Yeah, there could be a lot of issues on that. First off, we did find that if the keyword is in the title or subtitle that Amazon definitely gives it more preferential treatment. I mean, the truth of the matter is they understand that if somebody types in a title, they're looking for it. The problem about titles though, is that there are so many titles that are descriptive phrases and descriptive phrases that end up being titles. So it's very hard for like, it's not like Amazon acknowledges that because your title is this, we will absolutely give you the, the benefit out and show you. So what it could be is that books have proven that when they type in that term or phrase, that they sell better than yours who has that as a title, okay? So in time, if Amazon continues to see that when people type in that term or phrase, their people are not selecting your book, you will drop down until there may become a time where you're just not there anymore. So it could be that. There could also be the fact that uh, sometimes I've seen where 
there are a couple of people who've gotten a penalty, but these people know that they got a penalty. I've had a couple of people who said, hey, I can't find my book on Amazon. And then when digging, they finally admitted, well, I did get this warning from Amazon. And I was like, okay, did you fix the warning? Well, no. Okay. Um, if I type in your book, like all this information, it doesn't show up. No, nope. but my link works. Yep. Yeah, it's, that's, you got to fix that warning. So those are only the two things where I've seen with it. Sarah's asking, when it comes to becoming number one in a category, does Amazon calculate per book sales or per orders only? I'm not sure what exactly the difference would be there, but can you speak about getting to that number one category spot and what, what are some of the factors? Yeah, there's only two things Amazon takes into account for the paid categories, okay? Uh, and I say that because there's actually a free category section. The first is a sale. As in, I went to the book sales page, I clicked it and I bought it. The second is a KU download, okay? Not KU pages read, but a KU download. This is one of the reasons why a lot of authors do see KU books benefit over non-KU books. Not because Amazon has this internal thing where it's like, oh, let's make KU books show up more than non-KU books. Ha ha ha. It's actually because Amazon sees that when somebody typed in this keyword phrase and these books showed up, a KU shopper knows that KU books are free for them. So they're going to select a KU book and they're going to download it. And Amazon triggers that as in, hey, when we presented this book, that made the customer happier, the happier they, that's, that was the final result. So this converted. So it's a sale and it's a KU download. Now, is it the point of sale or the point of delivery? So when I put my credit card information in and I click buy, does that mark the, the change in the ABSR? Or is it when finally Amazon ships it? And I honestly don't know the answer to that. I think it's, it's, if it's a print on demand book, I'm pretty sure it's near instantaneous since the print on demand will happen automatically. But if you did an FBA, which is called fulfillment by Amazon, where you sent in the books to Amazon, and then when somebody buys it, then in their warehouse, they will then ship it. I would guess that that situation is upon shipping and not upon ordering. Okay. A follow-up from Sarah. When people order more than one book at a time, how does that impact sales ranking? Yeah, that's a good question. I honestly don't know. I've seen it work both ways. That's why I'll say I don't know. And let me be clear. I'll be the first person to tell you when I'm not sure of an answer. And with that one, I have had people when they bought it, it was instantaneous. And it was very clear that it was from the 20 books that they bought or the 100 books that they purchased or whatever. I've also seen where people did it and it didn't move the needle at all. I don't know. There are way too many factors uh, to play into that. It could be the way that they bought it. It could be the fact that it was the author who bought it, you know, and therefore is obvious that it was the author. And so they're not taking that into account. Whereas if it's not the author, they're like, well, it's not against the author that some school decided to buy it for all these people or that the libraries put in a huge order. There's just too many variables to be able to say one or the other. I would guess, and again, I'm going to stamp my foot and say, this is my guess, is that if you bought it yourself, or even if you paid for a whole bunch as a gift, I think pretty sure Amazon doesn't treat that. It just doesn't acknowledge it. Whereas if somebody else who Amazon hasn't figured is connected to you, like your publisher or something like that, then they treat it like it's legit sales. I started to look at some of the new updates that you've done with Publisher Rocket. And I noticed that you're including UK categories now. What I'm not sure of is how do I know which ones are UK? and which ones are US and how do I take advantage of this new benefit that you've added to the tool? So in the top right corner of Publisher Rocket, you can select which market you want Publisher Rocket to focus on. So you see a little American flag there currently, click on that and then you can click on the German flag, the UK flag or the US flag. When you do that, Publisher Rocket immediately switches to absolute focus on just that market. So keyword search, Amazon ads, categories, they all flip to just focusing on that market. One of the things that we did to be able to include those markets is we have deals with publishing companies inside of those countries that help us to keep our analysis and checked and verified as accurate as possible. So you can see the searches per month on the UK market for that keyword, so long as you've selected it. For those who can't speak or read German, we also have a language switch. So you can switch the language. Now it switches Publisher Rocket's language, not the words you see, because we have to keep that real for you because 
if you want to use that German keyword, you got to copy the German keyword, uh, not the translation of it. Otherwise, it doesn't help. So that's one thing. So when you do select the UK market, now when you click on the category feature, it will list all of just the UK categories for books and eBooks. I think it's actually 6,000. So there's 5,000 less categories than there is on the US one. And you can see all the same numbers. And again, that's for the UK market. So if it says you need to sell two books in order to be the number one bestseller in that UK category, then that's two UK sales, not two US sales. They're very important. We have an article on Kindlepreneur that actually talks about the process on how to change your international categories. You can absolutely do that. As a matter of fact, you can have 10 ebook and book categories on Amazon US. You can also do the same and they can be completely different for the UK market, the German market, any market that your book's a part of, you can change your category specifically to theirs. So that is a very important thing. You can't do that for your keywords though. So you can't choose, you know, seven boxes for US, seven boxes for UK, seven boxes for German. Nope. Whatever you chose for the one market is the one that's always used for all the markets that you're a part of. But basically it's kind of hard because there's a specific link that you have to use to contact Amazon. But if you just Google changing international book categories, the article should show up number one in Google. You can click on that and you can follow the step-by-step -step on exactly what you need to do so that your book shows up in the UK categories you want and the German categories and so forth. Great, that's awesome. I didn't even realize that that feature was there other than you know watching one of your articles, but I didn't know that you could switch. So I'm gonna to have to try that out, that's awesome. How much, Katie's asking, how much does price matter with regard to conversions? Yeah, actually, we're trying to do an experiment to get more data on this because I think pricing is becoming more important as we go forward in the market. But I'm going to generalize what I've seen. And again, I haven't had enough data points to be able to solidify this. But what I have seen is that $299 and $399 seem to be in their own group, okay? People don't see too much of a difference between $299 and $399 as shoppers. $4.99, $5.99 is in its own pocket, as in people will be less likely to pick up a $4.99, $5.99 book. And then there's the next group, which again, the $5.99, I'm not sure where it sits in here, but $5.99, $6.99, $7.99, $8.99, $9.99, and $9.99, that's in its own level. And again, you're going to have a lot less people that are going to choose to purchase your book because it's up there. Now, that's a generalization for all books. It could be different for children's books. I don't have enough data to be able to say specifically, but one thing I will say is that we are starting to see that a bit of a higher price is usually putting in the shopper's mind that this is probably more professional, but that only works if they look at your book or your cover, or your art or whatever it is and say, yeah, that is much more professional. There is a author of mine and I do not have permission to use his book because there's particular data. So I'm just going to call it the dog book. This author created this gorgeous artistic book about this dog. And he actually found that when he raised the price uh, significantly and looked like it was a published book, he made more sales. Okay. Not just more money because of course the price is higher. So more money, but he made more sales slash orders because he raised the price. And I think it was because he finally proved that he was, you know, because the price helped to prove that this book truly was one of the higher end books. And it was a very, very important step for him. However, though, I've seen people who tried to run with the big dogs, we'll just go with it here. And they priced their book high next to the big ones and it just fell flat on its face. The sales dropped, everything happened because people saw that price and looked at the quality and said, that doesn't connect. One other question that I get a lot is, you know, what's a good conversion rate for your book? And should they be paying a close attention as they're setting up ads to the conversion rate? Yeah, that's again, one of those, it depends. I've collected some on fiction and some on nonfiction. I can't say specifically on children's books. I don't have enough data for it, but conversion rates, there's the conversion rate from impressions to clicks. Then there's in conversion rate from clicks to purchases. I would say if you're going to twist my arm and I got to come up with a generalized one, conversion rate from click to purchase should be 10 to 15%. I hate saying the number because it's really hard. It really depends on a lot. But yeah, I'll throw that one out there as the generalized term. I don't know specifically enough for children's books. So I'm going to stamp my foot on that and say that that's kind of my belief.
but I'm not experienced enough in the children's books conversion rates because I also think demographics is kind of a part of it too. The age group would change my number. So yeah, sorry. Okay. So the goal is to continue to see the conversion rate increase and improve and adjusting and trying different things to get there. Just knowing your conversion rate, I think is more than most. If you're converting less than 10% from click to buy, then yeah, there's something that really needs to be tweaked. If it's more than that, then you're probably on the right area. You just kind of need to maybe start focusing on bringing in the right people. If you've proven that when your book gets in front of people and you're converting at 30%, you know, or we'll just give it an easy 33%, right? One out of every three people that click on it, buy it. Then I would actually focus more on getting it in front of those people, those type of people again, um, so that you can really scale up. So if you're in that 15, 25 and above on conversion rate, then focus more on the impressions and getting those people. If you're under that, then focus on trying to fix that so you can get to a higher conversion rate. And like I said before, all of your marketing efforts will improve because now your book converts better. Have you ever thought, Dave, of pulling some analysis and doing some deep dives into children's books? Because most of us are part of a huge children's book Facebook group of about 30,000 authors. So we would love to partner with you at some point if you're ever looking to do a deep dive and do some more analysis into that niche. Actually, the cool part is we'll be able to do that automatically. So one of the neat things about Rocket is that we actually switched to a server-based system. And the goal for that is that Rocket is now collecting information on Amazon proactively. We're sending out crawlers, we're tracking all the books and what they're doing and their sales and how the categories and how the, the genre as a whole is performing. And so now we're, we've been developing historical data. One of the cool updates and upgrades that we're going to be coming out soon is that we're going to be able to show people historical data. So what you can go is you can go into Rocket, you can look at a category and you can see how it's performed. You can look at your genre and see the trend, whether it's up or down, you know, is this certain type of children's book really taken off if it's going down? And we're trying to also find ways to then take the mass data. Like for example, our system, we know what books are selling. We know what their prices are. We can start to, and we can have like a million data points, if you will, and then start to really find out what the right pricing is automatically. We're actually hiring a whole bunch of data analysts to come in and help take all this mass terabytes worth of information and really bring it down to something useful. So those are going to be free upgrades for authors. Once, once awesome. we can figure out how to get it, we got the data, which is- Yeah, gonna... that is awesome. And I highly recommend for those of you that don't have Publisher Rocket, one thing I love about Dave's tool versus some of the others is you're not paying a monthly fee. It's a one-time purchase and every time it never fails, I log in and there's a new version and they've improved something. Dave and his team of developers has done an amazing job to continue to add value to this tool. And I use it almost daily with the authors that I'm helping. And I am an affiliate, so I do believe in Dave Chesson, his tools and what he does. And he is just a wealth of information. So for those of you who don't have the tool and are looking for it, I'll put you know some information in this video replay and we'll make sure that you have a link to it. What drew me into Dave Chesson's world was the AMS free ad training. I just couldn't believe, and I think I sent you an email after going through it, Dave. I was like, I can't believe all of this was free. The amount of value and what I learned going through that is better than what I could have paid for $500 for a course. It just continues to grow the tools and the resources that he provides. So kudos to you, Dave, for what you do for authors. And I really appreciate all of the time that you've spent with us today look forward to continuing to watch Kindlepreneur and watch you grow as you're, you know, continuing to do more and more within the author community. Oh, well, thank you. Well, that really means a lot here. And, uh, and thank you for having me. It's been really great. Thanks everybody. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye guys.